I'm going to start and uh, insist on a rule um, that's just going to be in place for two or three slides um, because I do want to tie up just a couple of loose ends that came up during the meeting. Uh, and the rule is I want you to suspend your horror and indignation at, at what I'm going to do over the next slide until a slide or two after that when you'll all realise it's not quite so bad. So the, um, the loose end I want to tie up is, is PLOD, which was um, an activity or programme that, um, that uh, was done to help build the, uh, the CSD that you heard about before. Now, CCDC knows a thing or two about organising information and knows a thing or two about finding information. Um, so Claire, Claire McRae, who's our longest serving employee, who's the person who really should know where all the, all the bodies are buried, um, went away to see what, uh, what PLOD actually was. And PLOD is indeed uh, a, a plotting of diagrams um, uh, utility. And um, disappointingly, when Claire searched for, for PLOD, that wasn't really the first hit that she, that she got. So Claire searched our uh, source code repository, which, is, which has got three million or so lines of code. And um, this, these were the hits that um, she found. So <laughs> the, the top hit was actually, um, my nipples will explode with delight. Um, yeah. Um, now, responsible for that is, is, a, is a certain Ian Bruno. Um, <laughs> but uh, in, uh, in Ian's defence, this is actually a, uh, a graphics library that's been um, incorporated into, um, into the CSD toolkit. And actually there's a, a placeholder for some text that you can replace um, in these, these graphics lines. And, um, the, uh, the text that they've chosen to use is actually from, from Monty Python, so it's nowhere near as, as, as vulgar as, as you imagine. It's simply a, um, an instance from a, a well-respected um, comedic group um, of, the, uh, of the 70s. So, plod has now been dealt with. <laughs> Let's get on to the presentation proper. Um, Olga showed this picture of herself, Banal, and the rest of Banal's group. And in a, in a talk that she gave back in the 1990s, she, she wrote it up and said that herself and Banal had a, a passionate belief um, that the collective use of data would, uh, would transcend the value of uh, individual data points. And, and this is a prediction. It's a, a prediction that they made. It's a prediction that they made um, in the 50s. And it's a prediction that started to come true in the 60s. And a few of the speakers have looked back at the 60s and, and tried to put some context on the, uh, the start of the CSD. And there were um, miniskirt-cladded um, girls screaming at the, uh, at the Beatles. Um, sadly, war was, uh, war was underway. And um, some of these things are still with us. But it was a time of tremendous change. So it's quite brave to make a prediction like that. It's even braver when you look at the technology changes that were happening in 1965. So in 1965, the, uh, the cassette tape was patented. Um, the first Starship Enterprise was, uh, was built. Um, this is Baker, a little monkey. He was uh, sent into space and returned alive. Probably not too happy, but he was, he was alive. Um, and we saw the first, uh, the first spacewalks. And there were some rudimentary computing in place to, uh, to control this, this mission. So it was a time of, of, of tremendous, tremendous change. Um, and over the years, um, people worked to, uh, to implement that, uh, that vision and to realize that, uh, that vision. These are, I think, my two favorite, favorite pictures. This is um, top floor of the biochemistry department. Uh, some of these editors are here. You'll recognize yourselves um, on, on this picture. And some of the other people here will, will recognize themselves um, as, as well and um, reminisce fondly of how, how handsome they, uh, they used to be. Um, OK. Now, the CSD was, was instantly very popular. And Jason mentioned this, this review by George Jeffrey, um, which came out in, in 1977. And it's quite an amusing view. And, and there's some interesting things that it, that it says. So, one of the things that's interesting is that uh, if we had 
carried on producing the CSD in the same way, um, this volume would actually be two and a half meters thick. Um, but the interesting thing he kind of says here is, is this bottom sentence. He says there's a, a sense of money's worth um, with the books. And whether he knew what he was saying or not, he said that might not be um, such a sense of money's worth when you get a microfiche. Now, this is kind of telling because he's associating a financial value with a book, and he's saying it's more difficult to associate that financial value with something much less tangible. And it's a recurring theme in the history of the CSD is that um, the financial value people put on data, as opposed to the financial value people put on objects and, and material things. And we'll return to this financial aspect uh, later on in the presentation. Um, at the end of George Jeffrey's review of, of the CSD, um, as Jason pointed out, he said, uh, thank heavens that, uh, that people did it when they did. And I guess our job is to think about the things that people will be saying thank heavens for in the future. So we need to be doing the things now that need to be done now. So let's look at some of the challenges that we're going to face and what we might do about them. Um, before I do, this is a presentation based on predictions. These are some predictions um, made in 1965 and, and slightly afterwards. Um, no one arrived on the jetpack this morning, and I didn't see anyone park uh, a flying car here. Um, this chap who thought he knew lots about computers said there would only be a market for half a dozen or so computers. Uh, and this lady um, announced that there would, uh, there would never be uh, a female prime minister in her lifetime. And, and for good or bad, some of these things came true, some of them, uh, some of them didn't come true. Um, but it shows that it's difficult to make predictions. Um, 1965, Time magazine had uh, on, its, um, on its cover an article about computers. The entire issue was about the computer in society. And, and this is interesting because it explains the value of computers in processing data and processing information. But it's also an insight into society in 1965 as well, in that it would only be women who would be processing these, the, these checks. Um, and this is something that, that features as well, the, the, the role of women and the change in, in society. So yeah, that's a relatively sensible, um, well-validated prediction. But in the same issue, this prediction was made as well. Um, now. Yeah, I feel rather sad that this one, this one didn't, didn't come true because I do think I'd adjust rather well to, um, <laughs> to a, to a, li a non-functional non -functional life. But um, sadly, that's, that's actually not, a, not an option available to me. But um, some predictions are good, some predictions are bad. Bear that in mind when we, uh, we go through the presentation. Um, one of the most delightful aspects of this role is sitting on the US National Committee for Crystallography, which is established by the National Academy of Sciences. These meetings of the, of the US NCR, uh, as you can imagine, are fascinating, one of the most stimulating things I do. Um, it's okay, Americans don't get irony, so you know, it's, it's, we're, we're safe, it's fine, it's fine, it, 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 it will be fine. Um, but, but back in 1976, this committee made some, some predictions, and, and these are quite interesting because you know, we heard today that, uh, well not today, yesterday, Martin Stahl, he was interested in the, uh, the confirmations of, of ring systems. We've heard a lot about people uh, studying bond lengths and angles and, and planarity. Um, how about this? Unusual bonding capabilities associated with electron deficient elements and with halogens. So back in 1976, this is 76, 86, 96, 2006, 2015, 40 years ago was the prediction of what we'd be, what we'd be interested in and here we are talking about exactly what these guys thought we would be interested in. Um, so it is possible to make some good predictions and, and encouraged by this, I'll, um, I'll start, to, uh, start to make some. This is an interesting one as well, look, the role of hydrogen in, uh, in these interactions. Um, the easiest, most obvious prediction, the most obvious place to start is the, the growth of the amount of structural information available to us. And we've seen this plot hundreds of times. And of course, it's really easy to, uh, to extend this up. So the number of structures determined every year 
is 9% more than the number of structures determined in the previous year, if you average over this last 10-year period. So every year we get 9% more structures determined. So of course you can, uh, you can extend this, just taking the first derivative of this, this curve, you, you can extend this. And you might think the curve would look something like this, and that this is a really easy prediction. And uh, um, it, Well, we're going to extend this curve. I've replaced the histogram with this line, and we're going to extend this curve. I've got lots of data. It's going to be really easy to extend this. Okay? But this isn't actually just a line replacing that histogram. This is actually the prediction. And this is where we are on that curve. So this is actually the data that we're basing that prediction on. So the first 50 years has taken us to here. If we take that curve and extend it, this is where we'll be in the next 50 years. Now, I don't believe this. Um, yeah, we, could, we, could, we could go on and we could extend this um, forever until we run out of enough matter in the universe to, take, to, to make crystals to, to study them. So it is, of course, going to be uh, some sort of sigmoidal curve. Don't know quite what shape it will be. But it certainly won't be like this. But even if you assume there's a 1% growth each year in the number of structures that we determine, it still goes up to a, to a pretty high figure. So one thing we can guarantee is we will have a lot of data to deal with. Um, it's not just about numbers. It's about all sorts of changes in the database. And you might have seen in a, in a newsletter that you'll have, you'll have probably picked up some of the notable events in this 50-year timeline of, of the CSD. What I'm going to do is to take this timeline and extend it over the next 50 years. And what I'd like you guys to do is to challenge me on both the events I've predicted and where I've predicted them in the timeline, and also challenge me on what we should be doing now in order to prepare for those events. So some of those predictions are, are really easy. So we'll start right at this end here. And it's a prediction that has already come true. You guys all know that you can now get crystal structures really easily on your phone, no passwords, no login, any of that kind of stuff. You can just go away with them. And I've chosen this ref code um, particularly um, not to reflect the audience, um, but just to reflect the, uh, the lecture theatre that, that we're in. And if anyone has seen the Muppets, um, <laughs> just cast your eye up to, to Waldorf and Statler. And, um, thank you, Waldorf. And, uh, and, and, Here's a ref code. You can all go away and you can look at that. Um, I'll make another prediction. That prediction is that in two months' time, we'll have the 800,000th crystal structure in the CSD. I'll also make a prediction that, in all probability, that structure will contain a metal. And it will probably be some sort of framework, framework structure like, uh, like this one here. Um, let's move on. Um, Susanna talked about. Um, the presence of different elements in the CSD as it's grown. So my prediction is that the next new element we'll see will be neon. It will probably be captured in a, in a fullerene. And people will probably look at, look at it using mercury, as I've done here. This is straight out of the box from, from mercury. And we'll all enjoy looking at, uh, at structures like this. And, and, and I guess this is my, uh, my crystal ball. Um, we'll move on a little bit further and look at other techniques. So the other thing that will happen is we will include structures from non-diffraction techniques. This structure here is determined by microscopy. microscopy. It's non-contact atomic force microscopy. But this is a real space image of molecules. And you can even see the hydrogen bonds in this image here. So Technology will clearly, clearly change the way in which we see structural information. The CSD will no longer be a crystallographic database. Um, some of the structures in the CSD won't even have any direct experimental information to, to verify them. Anthony Riley will, will run and administer the, the blind test um, later on this year. Lots of people will enter the blind test. Many of them will correctly predict the crystal structures of some of those molecules. And I can see no reason whatsoever why we shouldn't incorporate those predicted crystal structures in the CSD. And we will need to respond to the prediction of crystal structures. Um, so let's now move on to um, who will be looking at crystal structures in the CSD and who will be using that information. So this is a picture of the world that we've colored 
according to the arrangements that we have in place with those nations to help fund the CSD. Um, now, anywhere in, in dark green on this map um, makes provision at a, a national level to make a contribution to the CCDC to allow us to continue to, uh, to sustain the CSD. And if you're fortunate enough to live in one of these countries, um, you can immediately download the CSD, use it without any further, further restriction, share all of your information with your, your colleagues and, and collaborate in a, in a very effective way. If you're not fortunate to live in one of these countries, you can't do that. Now, anyone can access an individual crystal structure, but in order to access the structures en masse, we require an agreement. And essentially that agreement says, well, I'll use this, but I promise not to redistribute it. Now, it doesn't matter what cost we put on that agreement. It doesn't, ask if we, it doesn't matter if we ask just for a pound for, for someone to do that. That's still a barrier to use. So it certainly doesn't put off expert structural chemists. It certainly doesn't put off crystallographers. But I am absolutely convinced it does put off casual users who would make tremendous benefit from the CSD. If only it was there, absolutely immediately and absolutely instantly. And we still have a challenge to make sure that the entire planet is green. And we really need to work very, very hard on our funding model to make sure that that barrier is taken away. That's something we've absolutely got to address. Um, so the um, structures those people will be looking at will come from around the world. and. This is shaded by where those crystal structures will, will look at, and we've, we've cut this at a, at a particular level. And the majority of those structures will come from the US, UK, Germany, France, India, and China. If I'd cut this at a different threshold in this year, these two guys would be a different color to the rest of the world. The majority of our crystal structures will be coming from China and India. Um, now, It's always difficult to associate science with scientists. And it's a tremendously surprising thing to most people that that's a problem. And it's a huge problem to us, tremendous problem. And one of the things that the CSD would actually benefit from most is proper adoption of universal science identification systems. So one thing I do hope happens, and one thing that I predict will happen, is there will be a global uptake of a system something like ORCID, so we can properly associate science with scientists and, and, and with their research. So that will be tremendously enabling for us. Um, those scientists whose structures we'll be, we'll be looking at will contain even more new elements by this point, and we'll start to see our first crystal structures containing radium. Um, we'll also um, see a millionth crystal structure at this point, and it may be, well be something like this, published just two weeks ago, huge, huge nanoparticle, um, and we'll start to see more of these, these, these nanosystems, and we'll have to develop new ways to visualise and to represent these. It's really hard to figure out what's, what's, what's going on here um, at this sort of atom and bonds representation. Now, the protein crystallographic community are fantastic at looking at representations of complex biomolecules. We really need to look hard at representations of non-biological molecules. Um, so we're at this point here. We're at um, 2019. And the next stop on this timeline is, is really quite different as well. So. At the moment, a huge element of science is still competitive. Um, data is viewed as being owned. Um, someone will produce some data, that will be their data. Um, what I see is a change in that, and I'll see, I see that the most successful scientists will be the most collaborative scientists. And data, at the point it is produced, will be open. So we won't make data open at a certain point in its lifetime. There won't be organizations that do that. Um, data will be born open. It will be immediately available for all. Now, what I hope is that that increases the amount of data that's available, and it makes it even more important that we're able to process those large, uh, large quantities and, and high information content data. So this will also be transformative in science. It's something that we should do 
all we can to encourage. Um, let's move on now, and we'll move on towards sort of 2020. Um, by then, we'll start to see more structures like this. This is a, a structure of a molecular sponge containing a, a gas molecule. So it's a molecule that's been dipped in a solution. This gas molecule has floated into it, and the structure's been determined of this sponge with this gas molecule. The advantage of this is you only need tiny, tiny quantities of these types of molecules to, uh, to determine their structure. Um, we'll move on even, even further, and... Um, now we'll move on to changes in the way that um, interpretations of data are, are shared. So there are already tremendous changes in the publication industry. Um, this is a timeline we might want to question, but I believe by this point, the literature will also be open. The concept of paying to access information published in journals will be gone by this point. All of those papers will be accessible to all, and other funding models will come in place. Um, the kind of things that we'll read about in those journals might be structures generated using free electron lasers and the like, and by this point, free electron lasers will be as established in structural science as standard synchrotron radiation is now. And the one thing that I really hope happens before the point I've put it on this plot, but I think this is about when it will happen, is actually to have a universal ID for um, molecular systems. So I think it's a tragedy that um, we're still scraping ground to try and find ways of classifying and linking and describing and numbering molecules. So another thing that will be tremendously helpful for us at the, the CCDC will be a system to uniquely identify a molecule or a compound um, globally. OK, we're going to speed up a little bit now because we're on to the, uh, the next timeline. Um, so 2021 will be interesting. In 2021, the vast majority of structures we receive will have resolved disorders. The concept of a representation of a crystal structure will be gone. Every system will have um, resolved disorder to it. We'll have to deal with that. Also at this point, I think the way in which we classify and partition data will change. So this is a picture of a protein. It's completely uninterpretable, and it's displayed in, in our software. Um, if we want a nucleic acid, we'll, we'll go and we'll look at a data bank like the, uh, like the PDB. If we want to look at an inorganic system, we'll look at something like CRISMET or, or the ICSD. But we'll have to go to different places. Now, I think the partition of different types of molecular information into different databases is partly responsible for the fact that we see very little research in the area of truly composite materials. So we seldom see people who've made a, a self-assembling, highly glycosylated peptide conjugated to a metal RNA system um, surrounded by some sort of metal or plastic. It doesn't happen. And I don't think we help the development of those systems by having our data and our databases so separated. So what I truly hope we see is a proper federated network of databases where we really encourage research at the, the interface between them. Um, Let's move on from the databases. Um, just to summarize um, Chick's talk, if that's possible, um, with just one picture here, we're, we'll be able to, um, to make molecules, purify them, crystallize them, and determine their, their structure on, on a little machine. So we'll get structures in that way. Um, and by this point, I'd like us to be in a position where we can describe molecules a little bit differently. So, at the moment, my simple view of, of molecules is you take some equations, and if you're clever enough, you add those equations together, and you can describe a subatomic particle. If you take those subatomic particles, squish them together, you'll get an atom. Take those atoms, join them together, and you can define a molecule. If you take those molecules and position them next to each other with some symmetry, you'll have a lattice. If you apply a volume to that lattice and, and a shape, you'll have a crystal. If you take those crystals and you put them together, you'll have a particle. Now, at each of those transition points, we use completely different language, and many times we have completely different scientists working in those areas. So we have a really discontinuous appreciation of matter. Now, what I hope we receive, by, we, we get to by this point on the timeline, is a much better way of describing matter that allows us to go from that whole spectrum so we don't have that segmented understanding. Um, Okay, 
the kind of matter we'll be describing at this point will be analysed in solution as well in the solid form. So we'll start to see lots of NMR data and the like. And as we've heard in, in previous um, presentations, we won't need single crystals. So powder diffraction will take the lead. Immediately after that, powder diffraction will, will disappear as we get some fantastic um, energy sources to look at um, samples that are, that are so small we, we, we don't even need to, um, to take a whole powder. The kind of things we'll look at will probably be things like these metal organic framework type materials. And by this point, these will be established in consumer technology. We'll be using these to transport hydrogen. We'll be using these to, uh, to capture CO2. And this will be established technology. And this will address some of the, uh, the scary issues that Krista raised. Um, about that point, we will be able to not just predict the energetically most favorable crystal form, we'll be able to predict the entire solid form landscape available to us for any molecule. At this point as well, we won't be throwing away what we currently consider as being noise in X-ray diffraction experiments. So um, this is a, a picture of some results of a diffraction experiment. And, and what we tend to analyze is these bright white spots here. We actually throw most of the information away, which is non-brag or diffuse scattering. And we interpret that as noise. It's not noise. It's not random, random data. It's telling us something about that system. And at this point, we'll be able to make use of that. Now, We've heard from some, some crystal engineers here, and um, I may be wrong, but I think it's unlikely that any of the crystal engineers we've heard from will win the, the Nobel Prize in 2027. They might. Um, but I think a better recognition is going to be that one of them wins the Turner Prize at this point in time. So they will create, invent, describe, design, synthesize and represent a material where it's been designed from first principles. To me, that's art. Um, OK, at that point, things are going to get really interesting. And, and we're going to return back to, to dinosaurs. Because at that point, we're going to start to see some really interesting molecules from recreated biosynthetic pathways from extinct organisms. So we'll start to see the structure of materials that haven't existed on Earth for in the region of 5 billion years. So that's going to be quite exciting. Um, of course, we'll get structures from, from Mars, and we'll see extraterrestrial um, structures. But we actually, we already have some. This is a, a representation of a really interesting lattice found in a, in a meteorite that, uh, that crashed on Earth. And it's a material that's never been seen on this planet. And we'll start to see more of this. Um, um, yeah, the next point is interesting because the next point is something that isn't going to happen in 2032, and it isn't going to happen because of the CSD. So what's not going to happen in 2032 is our most important antiviral medicine isn't going to be withdrawn from the market, and millions of people aren't going to die as a consequence of that. Nobody's going to notice, but that will be directly down to the research that we do, that events like that don't happen. We won't get any thanks for it. Um, OK, let's move to the end of that pipeline, and we'll go to the next one. By 2035, we'll be able to design really, really complex materials uh, and understand and predict their structure right off the bat. But then something really bad's going to happen. So brace yourselves, but in, in 2044, mouse flu is going to jump to humans. Um, mouse flu is going to be really, really nasty, and it's going to threaten the entire human race. Um, the good news is immediately after that, CSD-based technology is going to deliver a cure for mouse flu. So if you manage to survive just those three days between the jump of mouse flu to the point at which we all invent a cure, you'll be fine. And that cure that we invent will be absolutely designed right from the load of, at of atoms right to the point at which we distribute that cure. We'll design everything. So at the moment, if we build an aeroplane, and in fact, if you go back to Concorde, which was designed in 1965, Concorde's maiden flight in 69 went without a hitch. Press reports are fantastic. It was designed, it flew, it was brilliant. Why can't we do that with medicines? Why do we spend years and years and years testing medicines? Surely we can design them. Right, let's move forward right to the end now. And those of you that are probably 50 or, or less will be 
invited back here. You'll even look in better shape than you do, than you do, you do now. And we'll all gather round and we'll, uh, we'll open our um, videogram from um, King George VII, who will send us a, a nice centenary videogram. And we'll all sit around and, uh, and pat ourselves on the back, but also look back at the things that we could have done better. Um, I'm going to finish with this quote. Again, it's from Olga. And it, uh, it's an extract from something that she wrote 20 or so years ago. Um, and again, this is actually a prediction. And I think this prediction is still true today. And I think there's a tremendous amount of science that we can do. And it's going to be really exciting. Um, of course, there's lots of people to acknowledge for this. Um, some of the images I've taken off the internet, I'll give full credit to those in, 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 a, in a written version of, of this. And everyone here has contributed to this, uh, this presentation. I'd like to thank you for that.